Slay the Spire Downfall is a huge mod that adds an entirely new game mode where you switch sides to defend the heart from the vanilla characters trying to climb the spire. You do this as one of the four new classes that you can now play in this mode, being all three of the Act 1 bosses starting with the slime boss and even as a Sneko as the fourth playable character. This mod is meant to be like a complete expansion to the game, keeping everything world and lore friendly and adding a ton and ton of new content. You begin at the very top of each act as the boss normally would, it's your job to descend the floors down the spire to reach the bottom where one of the four vanilla characters will be waiting to fight you. The hallway and elite fights along the way will all remain the same. The main differences in this downfall mode comes with the new classes, boss fights, and many many new events. All of this content being incredibly well designed and super fun to play. Like I mentioned, the slime boss is the very first class that you'll have unlocked with this mod before you beat Act 1 to unlock the next class. This class is actually an updated and heavily rubriced version of the Slimebound mod by the modder Michael Mayhem. Most of the classes in Downfall are heavily reworked and rebalanced versions of his old mods, which is really awesome to see all of his work come together in one package. The classic Slimebound class mod is still available for those who want to play it. I made a video on it a very long time ago and I'm really happy to say that this slime boss class keeps a lot of the same ideas and archetypes but changes up a whole bunch of things, heavily rebalancing this class. The Heart of Goo starting relic now makes you heal 1 HP every time you consume any goop. Your starting deck already comes with a Corrosive Spit card, which can apply 6 goop for 1 energy or 0 energy if upgraded, a stacking debuff that simply makes your next attack deal that much extra damage. There are a ton of cards that apply and manipulate goop, like a whole set of different licks that apply a small amount of goop alongside other effects like gaining block, applying vulnerable, and much more for 0 energy each. This whole lick deck is an entire archetype, there's even a card that gets one extra damage for every single lick you have in your deck. And there are a lot of different attacks that gain a bonus effect when consuming goop, like leeching strike gaining block equal to the amount of goop consumed. Splitting into different slimes is a huge mechanic for this class. You start off with the basic zero energy split card in your starting deck that lets you choose one of the four basic slimes to split into. The options include a Bruiser Slime who attacks for 5 each turn, Gorilla Slime who attacks all enemies for 3 each turn, the Mire Slime who attacks for 2 and applies 2 goop, or the Legion Slime who attacks for 2 and gives you 2 block. This card can be upgraded to split into 2 of these slimes instead of 1, but you only have 3 slots to split the slimes into, and if you spawn more beyond that, you'll absorb your oldest slime and you'll gain 1 strength. These slimes are an amazingly powerful tool for this class, once you get started on some of the other cards to synergize with this whole idea. Most importantly, any card with the keyword command will cause your front slime to attack that many times, and the cards that give you potency will increase the damage of each of your slime summoned. There's a common card for each of the four basic slimes that summon that specific slime and command up to three times. These are actually pretty strong, for example, the one that summons a Gorilla Slime will give you the slime that deals 3 damage to everything each turn, and then also deal 3 damage 3 times, 9 damage to all enemies. That's actually pretty powerful. But these aren't the only slimes available. There is actually quite a few special ones available from events or even colorless cards, like the Greed Ooze who will steal your money from when you visit a campfire in exchange for extra damage, the Darkling Slimes who will spawn and attack as a group of three, and a few more that I'll let you discover. The rest of your deck is the basic 4 defense and 3 strikes. There's only 3 strikes in the starter deck instead of 4 because one of them is replaced with a tackle, a 1 energy attack that deals 10 damage and 3 damage back to yourself. This tackle seems pretty simple at first, but it's really a whole other archetype that you can build around with a bunch more different tackles that usually have the theme of dealing heavy heavy damage to the enemy and also a little bit of damage to yourself. But cards like Roll Through can negate the self-inflicted damage of the next few tackles and powers like Recklessness can increase the damage of all of your tackles by 3. You'll often find your HP being used as a resource while playing the slime boss, because whenever you lose max HP from splitting, you lose HP for the fight, being healed back at the end of it. The slime boss is probably the class that I played the most, especially when I'm including my playtime on the slime bound. 
I like this class a lot. This class has gone through so many iterations. This guy who made these classes is obviously a very talented class designer, uh, and you'll be able to see that with the next few classes that we'll talk about as well. This is super fun to play. And these four new classes, they're all pretty awesome. But one of the biggest features of this mod is the new boss fights against the original four characters. I'd hate to go so long on this video without talking about it in detail, so I'm going to stagger all of the features and classes in this video to keep things interesting. You can use the new YouTube chapters feature to skip through whichever thing you want to know more about if something doesn't pique your interest. Since you're playing as an act boss yourself, the bosses that you'll be facing now are the original four playable characters, the Ironclad, the Silent, the Defect, and the Watcher, all chosen randomly for each act. These bosses now have their own set of relics and cards, just as you would if you were playing as them in the vanilla game. Their starting relic, Niao's Blessing, slightly changes the basic mechanics that you'd expect. Instead of gaining 3 energy and drawing 5 cards a turn, these guys will now gain 2 energy and draw 3 cards a turn instead. This relic also gives them 100 max HP per act climbed to make sure they are balanced for the act that they show up in. They'll also have a bunch of other relics, even including ones showing you which events that they took and what they did with those events. You can see every card they draw just above them, the cards that they plan on playing will be highlighted and then shown the normal intent, whether it be damage, block, or both, or a power below that card. The rest of their hand will be grayed out and discarded at the end of their turn like normal. The first act bosses are at a point similar to where you would be in the end of act 1, just taking really whatever cards you would need to defeat the boss. There's no real archetype at this point, but they're all still pretty dangerous, especially when you get cards like Perfect Strike or Watchers that deal a ton of damage to you. In Act 2, you'll start facing these bosses with uh, some more relics and a set powerful build. For example, you'll see things like a Claw Defect with Dolly's Mirror, Copy and Claw, a Shiv Spamming Silent with Kunai and Accuracy, and a Strength Scaling Ironclad with a very hard hitting Heavy Strike. As your run progresses through Act 3, the boss's decks become extremely powerful. Their decks and collection of relics are something that you would kill for if you were playing the vanilla game. You'll face off against a block ironclad with calipers, juggernaut, and 60 damage body slams, a poison silent who will apply a crazy amount of poison to you with bouncing flasks, and a catalyst to triple that poison, a defect that will gain a ton of orb slots with inserter, and then spam orbs with a barrage that deals a ton of damage, or a watcher that will very quickly stack up mantra for divinity stands to just completely destroy you. These Act 3 boss fights are really tough, maybe even a little bit unfair, but this unfairness can be circumvented by collecting these three keys that you would normally use to get into Act 4, and then breaking them at the campfire to get these new relics. These relics will give you basic stats like max HP, strength, and dexterity, but they will also give you a copy of the special retained cards in the Act 3 boss fight for each relic that you collect. Against the Silent, these cards will make you lose all poison and make poison no longer go through block. Against Defect, it will remove all of the enemy's orbs. Against the Ironclad, it will remove all of the enemy's block. And against the Watcher, it will force her out of her stance and make her lose all of her mantra. Every single one of these bosses has some sort of scaling, as you would need in vanilla, and it will block a lot more often than the vanilla classes, especially when they have relics like Orialcum or Calipers. It seems to be very important to kill these guys fast, or they will be scaling. I've seen some other mods and even some other games try this whole concept of fighting an enemy with their own deck of cards and hands to draw in in a single player game. I've never really seen it done so smoothly and easy to understand as it's been done in this mod. These boss fights are really fun to play against. One thing that does bum me out a little bit though is that every single boss fight is a single target fight so taking AoE damage can feel pretty bad sometimes. The Guardian class is unlocked after beating Act 1 with the Slime Boss. Just like you'd expect, shifting modes, blocking, gaining a ton of thorns is a big part of his kit. But he also has some other new super interesting mechanics like gem socketing and the stasis system. Let's begin with his starting relic, Mode Shifter. When the Guardian takes 10 damage, he'll shift into defensive mode for the next turn. Defensive mode is a buff that usually lasts only one turn, very commonly used by this class that gives you 3 thorns and 2 block for every card played while in this mode. There are a lot of ways to enter defensive mode, that mode shifter starting relic that I just mentioned, and a starting card that causes zero energy to just enter defensive mode, and so many different cards, like piercing hide giving block, thorns, and then entering defensive mode. 
There are a bunch of ways to further buff defensive mode through several powers like evasive protocol giving extra dexterity during the mode, spiker protocol that gives extra thorns, and even with a bunch of relics like Balor's lordly plate giving you one additional block per card played. The other starting card in the Guardian's deck is Twin Slam. An attack dealing 4 damage twice and has an open socket. You can upgrade it to have a extra open socket. You might be wondering what these sockets are. This is probably one of the coolest mechanics added in this mod in my opinion. Throw all of your card rewards and shops, you'll have a chance to encounter these gems. There are a bunch of different ones. Zero mana cards that do a super simple thing like gaining one momentary strength, entering defensive mode, gaining one energy, and a few more. These gems aren't that great by themselves, sure they cost zero energy, but they do cost you the card draw which is a really important resource. The true power of these gems comes in socketing them. Every rest site you visit allows you to enhance as a free action, socketing any number of these gems into any cards you have with open sockets. Your starting deck has the twin strike as mentioned with two sockets and the curl card can be upgraded to hold one socket. But these two cards are actually pretty terrible and not really worth socketing gems into, but you'll come across a few amazing cards like Prismatic Barrier and Prismatic Beam dealing 5 damage or gaining 4 block per gem socketed in them up to 3 times. Bobble Beam deals some damage and can proc 2 different gems 3 times in one play. The other big new mechanic with this Guardian class is in Stasis, which is what these 3 slots around your character are for. You don't start with any Stasis capabilities, but you'll come across a lot of common cards that allow you to utilize this, like Recover, giving block and then placing a card from your discard pile into Stasis. All of your cards in Stasis will start with a counter equal to its energy cost plus 1, and this counter will tick down every turn until it hits 0. Then the card will go into your hand and cost 0 for that turn. This is a decently powerful mechanic by itself, nobody's going to complain about getting extra zero cost cards in your hand even if you do have to wait a little bit for that, but stasis can become an extremely strong mechanic when you pair it up with a bunch of extra synergistic cards like temporal strike and shield, having extra effects if you have a card in stasis, and some relics like cryo chamber giving you an extra stasis slot and upgrading every card that enters stasis. There's even a few cards that get stronger as they are in stasis using the tick keyword, like shield charger giving you block and energy every time it ticks down, and multi beam increasing the damage dealt by any beam cards by one with every tick in stasis. Another huge archetype for the Guardian is in Strength Scaling, which is a lot easier to understand than gems in stasis since it's just a vanilla mechanic. A card that I've had a lot of success with is Spot Weak Point. Putting a debuff on the enemy that makes you gain one temporary strength every time you hit them. Pairing this up with powers like Floating Orbs giving you a free 2 hit card every turn and attacks like Walker Claw getting affected by strength 2 times have absolutely been able to destroy this game for me. I really like the Guardian class, I feel like it went way above and beyond what you'd expect from a normal class mod with these super interesting and unique mechanics I've never seen before. You can have a lot of success with building him many different ways like full defense, full strength, a million gems, and there's a lot more you can do with him. Now let's talk about the events in this mod. I think the events in Downfall are absolutely the best events I've ever experienced in the several act mods that I've played so far. There are a bunch of different events specific to the class that you're playing. These brand new events are alright. Most of them add some really cool new mechanics and relics or cards, but what really shines for me are these events that put a new spin on the normal vanilla ones that we're used to. Most of these guys that approach you, like the clerics, the gremlins, and the augmenters, they'll all react differently to you now because you are a big giant boss monster. If you spin the wheel in the wheel event and you don't like what you landed on, you can yell at the gremlin until he calls in his knob bodyguard to fight you. And if you win that fight, you'll receive the wheel as a relic that allows you to spin it as a free action in every rest site, and choose if you want to keep that reward or roll again in the next rest site. In the Augmenter event that gives you the Jax, you can fight the Augmenter and take all three of his options if you win. The same idea goes for the Totem in Act 1 that gives you three choices. And if you encounter the three bandits that normally want to take all of your money, you can now hire them, and they'll help you on their first turn of the Act 3 boss, reducing their dexterity and applying some weak. These events are awesome. Like I said, they're definitely the highest quality of any Act mod that I've played. 
and it all fits into the world of Slay the Spire with the characters that we all know and love, or the ones that we hate. Hexaghost is the third character that you'll unlock in this mod, concluding the Act 1 boss trilogy. This guy's main mechanic revolves around igniting the six ghost flames that surround him, just as the vanilla boss does. You ignite these by playing the card types required, each one having a different effect, and then advancing to the next ghost flame on the next turn. The first ghost flame requires two attacks to apply for a soul burn to a random enemy, we'll talk about soul burn in a bit. The second flame requires two skills to deal four damage to two random enemies. The third flame is the same as the first one, and the fourth flame requires a power to gain four block and one strength. The fifth flame is the same as the first, and then the final sixth flame requires you to spend three energy and will deal four damage to a random enemy for each ghost flame ignited, then extinguishes all of your flames, effectively starting the cycle over. There are a lot of ways to make igniting these ghost flames more worth it. The starting relic Spirit Brand already gives you 6 block for the first time you ignite one each turn. The intensity buff given by a few cards will increase the damage, soul burn, or block applied by all of these ghost flames. And there are a bunch of cards that will force ignite the current flame, or attract to the previous flame, or advance to the next flame to manipulate this mechanic. Your starting deck comes with the float card that allows you to advance to the next flame for 0 mana. The upgraded one allows you to choose between retracting or advancing. And you're probably wondering what this soul burn that I keep talking about is. Your starting deck has this seer card that applies 9 soul burn for 1 energy. It's actually pretty simple, it's just a stacking debuff that deals its stacks as unblockable damage on the third turn after applying it. It's kind of like poison, except you have to wait a few turns for it to take effect. There are a ton of cards that apply and manipulate soul burn. It's definitely been the most successful archetype for me when playing Hexaghost. Cards like Burning Touch can apply a ton of this debuff, 10 soul burn by itself and then 10 additional soul burn if the enemy already has some. Pair this up with powers like Extra Crispy, making all soul burn apply 2 extra stacks each, and then something like Heat Crush that deals 30 plus the soul burn stacks on the enemy as front loaded damage. Since the Hexaghost is a ghost, ethereal cards are a big theme for this guy. You'll come across a lot of cards with ethereal, some of them even having the afterlife keyword which means that it will automatically play whenever it's exhausted. Common cards like this are Spectre's Whale that deals AoE damage, and Hexaguard gaining block and drawing a card. A lot of these ethereal cards are pretty strong, but you can then support them with synergistic cards like Ghost Lash or Shield, killing damage or blocking in extra time if you have any ethereal cards in your hand, or Paranormal Form, making you deal 7 damage to a random enemy whenever you play an ethereal card. There's this other archetype with this class, that are 6 different seal cards that you can collect, each being pretty lackluster powers that give you a bonus reward at the end of combat, like the second seal giving you some additional money, the fourth seal giving you an additional potion, and the sixth seal giving you an additional seal. These all have ethereal, aren't that strong, and clog up your deck, but if you manage to collect all 6 seals and play every single one in one combat, You'll be rewarded with a pretty awesome relic that I won't show you because I want you to try and find it yourself. The Hexaghost is pretty cool. Definitely the most complicated of all the classes. It took me a while to fully understand these mechanics, but hopefully me explaining this stuff can help other people beat up these Spire Slayers with this class much easier. Whenever you visit the shop, the shopkeeper will not want to sell to you, but he'll want to fight you. He always has the same cycle of blocking, attacking, stealing souls, and then leaving. After he flees, the heart will then appear through a portal, and then you can buy stuff from the heart. Every time you face this shopkeeper, he'll retain the HP that he had left in the last fight. So it's very possible to kill him before he flees if you visit him a few times, and then he'll reward you with all of the souls that he's stolen from you, plus a bunch more. This is a neat little mechanic. And on the topic of shopkeepers, let's talk about the colorless card pool that now has a bunch of new cards added, since the shop is the main source that you'd be finding these colorless cards. Most of these are boss cards. You can only play one boss card per turn, but they are all extremely powerful. Each of the vanilla classes will have at least one of their cards in this pool, like the Awakens 1 Awaken power, making you revive with 10 HP whenever you die, Chrono Boost, from the Timekeeper, gaining you 2 strength every 12 cards you play, 
deck as protection and don't use power, giving you either one dexterity or one strength and then adding either a random power or a random attack to your hand to cost zero this turn. There are a lot of new colorless cards and they're all pretty strong. This makes things like colorless potions and the event that gives extra colorless cards and even shops a lot more exciting. The playable Sneko is the 4th class, separate from the 3 Act 1 bosses and in its own little bubble. It's definitely the class I played the least of, so it will therefore be speaking the least about, but he's basically all about gambling. His starter deck comes with two unknown cards. These cards roll into any random card from any class at the beginning of combat, including the vanilla classes and any modded classes that you have installed. They keep this form for the rest of their combat, and then we'll reroll into a new thing at the start of the next combat. You'll come across a lot of different unknown cards that specify which type of card they can roll into, like unknown X cost cards, unknown power cards, unknown class specific cards, unknown vulnerable cards, and so much more. Most of the Sneko's card pool consists of these unknown cards. There are more of these than there are actual Sneko cards. And the starter relic Sneko Soul will increase your max HP by 1 every time you add an unknown card to your deck, so it would be pretty hard to play a Sneko run and not take any unknown cards. The other starting cards are Tail Whip, costing 2 energy, deal 10 damage and apply 0 to 3, weak and vulnerable, and Snack Bite, dealing some damage and muddling the highest cost card in your hand. When you muddle a card, the card's cost is randomized between 0 and 3, similar to how the Sneko Eye Relic and Confusion works. Muddle is a big mechanic for this class. There are cards like Soul Cleanse that will muddle your entire hand without allowing any of these to cost 3. There's not really much else to this class. Almost every single card that isn't an unknown card relies heavily around gambling with potentially large rolls. Dice Crush starting at 1 to 14 damage but increasing the max damage by 1 for every unknown card in your deck. And Dice Block doing the exact same thing but with block. To me at least, the main part of Downfall involves the first three classes which are amazingly well designed and well balanced. And then the Sneko is here as a fourth kind of side character to have a lot of fun with the new mechanics added through randomly achieving them and seeing what kind of crazy unbalanced mess that you can get. So you work for the heart in this mod. It wouldn't make sense for you to go and then fight the heart in Act 4 like vanilla, right? This mod completely reworks Act 4 into a new challenging endgame fight. If you want to discover all of this yourself, I'd highly recommend you to finish the video here and then go play. I've already talked about all of these super cool things that I wanted to. We still have the format of Super Hard Elite, Shop, Campfire, and then Super Hard Endgame Boss. In this case, the Elite is the Shopkeeper who has been resurrected and is now much stronger. His deck consists of colorless cards. He starts to turn with a Panic Button and a Bomb, which are both problems especially considering his calibers. He'll then go through all of his cards, doing what colorless cards do best. The main worry with him is that Bomb deals 40 damage on turn 3, and then he scales with a sadistic nature power applying a ton of debuffs to you every turn dealing extra damage to you. After that, you'll face off against the real boss, Niao. He has 300 HP. That seems pretty low, but don't let that fool you because his god of life passive will not let him die, at least not the first time. He starts the combat applying 4 really annoying new curses to you, and then cycles through really heavy hitting attacks and blocking and then gaining 6th strength. When you manage to get him to 0 HP, he'll retreat and then revive the Act 1 boss you fought earlier in this run with the same set of relics and cards but now with the vastly increased HP from the Niao's Blessing Relic. Once you kill this boss, you fight Niao again with the curses reapplied to you, and then he'll revive the Act 2 boss. You go through this again until the Act 3 boss, which gives you the special cards back from gathering those keys. When you beat this third boss, you are then able to kill Niao once and for all. Without a strong deck, this fight can go on for very, very long, which is a big problem because Niao is constantly gaining strength from his block move, and the three bosses that you'll face along the way all will have very strong scalings from things like strength, orb summoning, accuracy, mantra, or whatever version that you'll be facing has. I really really like the idea of this fourth act. It's an awesome conclusion, but I do think it's maybe a little bit too easy at the moment, at least on the early ascension levels that I've been playing in. This is fine because the mod is constantly being updated and balanced. I've found many times that some cards aren't the same as they were the previous day. A lot of work is going into balancing this mod. So in conclusion, this mod is awesome. 
You can tell that a lot of work and a lot of passion has went into this. The list of creators is pretty long and they all deserve props for creating such an awesome experience. The classes are all awesome, the boss fights are all really well done, and the events bring it to a whole new level. I'd highly suggest you try this mod out if you haven't been convinced already. It's really cool that all of the hallway and elite fights stay the same so you don't have to relearn an entirely new game. The only thing you really have to relearn are the boss fights and the new classes. If you like YouTube content like this, and are interested in the Slay the Spire modding scene or even the modding scene of any other games, then feel free to subscribe, I love making videos like this and giving these mods the publicity that they so well deserve. So thank you for watching and have a great day.